Everyone, thank you for joining us today. We're going to be doing the 2023 Geo Launchpad and Recess Internship Lightning Talks. My name is Anika Knight, um, and I'll give you a little overview of our program for today. Before we start, we want to start with the Code of Conduct. You're participating in an Earthscope sponsored event. Um, we expect that everyone on this call today will treat everyone with respect, consideration, that you will critique ideas rather than people, and that all communication will be professional and constructive. Take a moment to read through. We would also like to acknowledge that as the Earthco Consortium and the NSF Gage and SAGE facilities, we respectfully acknowledge the generation of peoples and communities that have been and continue to be the stewards of the land that we now use for our work. We ask that you join us in acknowledging their communities, their elders, both past and present, as well as future generations. This acknowledgement is really just one small part of our ongoing commitment to dismantling the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism. Um, using the QR codes below, you can see our notice stations that are on indigenous territories, and you can also see more resources on the historical territories of indigenous nations. So an overview of the programs I'll be speaking today. First, we'll be hearing from Geo Launchpad. Geo Launchpad provides community college students from Colorado, New Mexico, and Wyoming with the opportunity to develop research-ready skills and learn more about geoscience career pathways. Program lead for this is Kelsey Russo-Nixon. Other program we'll be hearing from is called Recess. It's Research Experiences in Solid Earth Sciences for Students. It's a one to potentially two-year independent summer research internship program that focuses on earth sciences. This program is dedicated to providing authentic research experiences for undergraduate students, as well as increasing the diversity within geosciences. And I am the program lead, and you can write. So an overview of both of our programs, both are 11 weeks. Um, starting this year, we had our traditional programs that have been based in Boulder, Colorado, since their inceptions. But we also branched out to Socorro, New Mexico. In doing so, we were able to get a different variety of projects for our students. Through the course of the summer, students partook in professional development, such as career circles. We brought in professionals from different fields to talk about their careers and how they got there. Um, we worked on different career and life skills, such as writing an elevator speech, working on a CV, a resume, what it might look like to apply to graduate school, to give the students an idea of what their next steps could be. We took students on field trips and mentorship has been a strong component of all of our programs. This fall, our students will, participate, will be participating in a scientific conference. Geo Launchpad interns will be attending GSA. Um, almost all of them got onto the Future Scholarship, so applause for them for their hard work. Recess interns will be attending AGU. Uh, we will also send out a list of all of our interns' presentations closer to the conferences. So while you're out this fall, please stop by and see their work. So our funding, we could not do any of this amazing work without funding. Both programs are primarily funded by the NSF GAGE um, under grant number 1424794. GLP has an additional grant, also an NSF grant, but the grant number is 2117397. Funding for our graduate assistant has been graciously provided by the University of Colorado Boulder through three different departments, and we greatly appreciate their donation to us. Additional support, we really could not do this all without our gracious mentors, different universities that are willing to collaborate and work with us each year, hosting students, mentoring students, and just providing additional support. Um, we'd also like to specifically thank our writing workshop instructor, our graduate assistant, Haley. She has worked hands-on with all of our interns reviewing their writing products, giving them advice, being a sounding board, and someone besides myself and Kelsey to talk to for their summer. We'd also like to thank the engagement team, the FAB team and really everyone at Earthscope because without you all doing all of your jobs, this would not have been possible. Okay, so our agenda for today, we're gonna go through our talks in two parts. All talks will be a lightning talk, which means that the talk will be five minutes with two minutes for questions. We ask that you use the Q&A function on Zoom. If you have any questions, you'll see it down below. It says Q&A. 
Um, and then we will have time for a break and then we'll move into the recess presentations. So up first, we have KC. KC, I will turn it over to you. Hello, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, can everyone see my screen? Okay, gotcha. All right, hello, my name is uh, Kristen Campbell and I'll be presenting uh, Misbehaving Minerals, Exploring Extraction Methods on Terrestrial Shocked Zircons. So a little bit of a background, a zircon is a mineral that is formed on earth or in space rocks. Um, what the importance is of them is they can record um, impacts, dates or ages. So, the my mentor went to southern Colorado and New Mexico. Uh, she went to four sites and collected samples from the Chicxulub impact ejecta or like from the KPG boundary um, to analyze. And so in the grand scheme of things, uh, the project will continue to date these. But what I did during summer was um, figure out methods because there isn't really any published methods for extracting zircons from really clay rich, difficult materials. So the methods that I took was um, my mentor, when she got the minerals, she went ahead and crushed them with a mortal and pestle and ethanol. So it was a wet crush. Um, then when I came in, I panned them like how people would pan for gold. Um, I would use these little powders, put them in with water, and pan and dry them. Then we did a density separation with a heavy liquid called uh, lithium metatone state or LMT. Then I would look under the microscope at the grains and pick out the ones that exhibited characteristics of zircons. We would take the ones that I'd pick to the uh, scanning electron microscope or SEM to verify if they were zircons or not. Once verified, we would cast them in epoxy resin and then sand and polish them. So those were what we did in the old methods. And in the new methods, nothing to, nothing really changed all that much except how I panned. Um, I did this thing where I kind of over panned because I was really lenient with my panning beforehand. I, had, I left a lot of sediment. So I panned until there was absolutely no runoff and till the only things that were left was the most heaviest. Then when we went to the density separation, we changed out our chemicals to methylene iodide or MI. And it was a better process overall, um, just so much easier to use because LMT also had strange reactions with clay. So the MI did not. And a step that we added in the new methods is sieving. So once we did the density separation, we got a sieve to about 150 to 100 microns and removed a lot of the bigger um, material that was left behind. And the reason why is because zircons tend to be about around 150, like no bigger than 150 microns. So it really did help um, tighten up what we had to work with. So in the end, the changes that we had made with the panning uh, using MI and sieving really did help in the end. It was less work in the lab um, or more like less time in the lab. Definitely MI was less work. It, it was so easy to use. Um, and we got higher yield. Uh, as of right now, we have found over 300 zircons from our samples. And compared to previously, that is a lot. <laughs> that was, as far as I've heard, we Previously, not much had been found. Um, so this really goes to show how much working on it can, can help. Um, the samples will be dated after my time at the internship. And yeah, that's it. That's, um, so I left some pictures of the zircons, close-up pictures of what they look like um, through the SEM. It's really cool. So yeah, I'd love to thank everyone. Thank the Behringer Family Fund for Meteorite Impact Research. I thank the people at CU Boulder Department of Geological Sciences. Thank you to the lovely people at Earthscope 
consortium. Thank you to my family, my partner, and my friends, especially Ruth, who pushed me to apply. <laughs> Couldn't have done this without her. I just appreciate all of the interns and everyone that I've met throughout this internship. It was just amazing. Thank you. I have questions, anyone? <laughs> that was great, Casey. There are some questions in the chat. Oh, okay. gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the questions from Nora, um, how much time did the new method cut? Just a rough comparison. Oh my gosh. <laughs> okay, so a rough comparison. I would say LMT took about oof, it, a full day to dry, maybe even longer. And MI would dry in like 30 minutes. So <laughs> definitely a lot of time was was cut down. Any other questions? And if you look at the Q&A function, I'm typing the responses in the answered part. So you will be able to see the answers there if you're interested. Oh, gotcha. Is there anything you would do differently if you were doing it again? Um, yeah, I would. <laughs> I was a little too scared when I was panning in the beginning to essentially over pan. And so we kept all the material afterwards. So I would just tell myself, don't be scared to just wind up with less material because in the end, it's going to be the heaviest material that you're looking for. Got a couple more quick questions if we have time. Okay. Go? Yeah. Okay. So Danny asked, was it difficult to create a method of finding the zircons? Not really. Um, there was some things that were written and my mentor had already uh, figured out methods before I got there. So I was able to come in and talk about things and we just kind of went with the flow and changed things as we went. Um, great. Um, Juan asked, amazing work. Will you continue to check on these projects after you're finished, after you leave? Yes, absolutely. I, I plan on staying in contact with the lovely people at CU Boulder. <laughs> Spencer asked, can you point out the shocked zircons in the last slide texturally? Uh, okay, let's see. Uh, we haven't really analyzed, oops, I haven't really analyzed them in that way quite yet, but uh, I don't know, like some of the ones that are bumpy, we still have some hypotheses flying around of what these textures are. And until my mentor goes and dates them and really looks at the textures, I really won't know. Nice. Um, Lon asked, do you have a prediction of the ages that will be obtained on the Zircons? Ooh, uh, you know, I, I actually don't. Um, that's a good question. Thank you for asking. <laughs> and Pamela asked, is there anything that you would do differently? Oh, yeah, um, definitely about the panning. But I guess another thing that I would do differently is take breaks while I would pick material because the microscope was a bit awkward and I would hurt my back or my neck and just be like, I need to take breaks. <laughs> that was great. Thank you, Casey. Thank you. So next up is Charles. If you'd like to share your screen. Um, how do I end share? Oh, wait, there it is. Awesome. Hello, everyone. Let's uh let's dive in. Oh, I'm not sharing yet. One second. Share screen. Awesome. All right. Let me just move some things around real quick and then we can jump in. All righty. So I was mapping aquifers along the middle Rio Grande Basin with a few other colleagues. One second. All right, awesome. So uh, if any of you don't know, the middle Rio Grande Basin is home for a lot of us New Mexicans. And this is a widely dependent on source here in New Mexico. We use this water for domestic use, whether it's for drinking, it's for agriculture, it's for our livestock, anything like that. It's a uh, it's depended on, and we use it every day here. And uh, coming into this, there was little to no data in regards to this basin. So me and two of my other colleagues 
were able to create an accessible map for the public and any officials who would be looking into this basin, whether it's for recharge or someone just wants to know if there is anywhere they can drill a well. So to, oh, so to begin with this uh, process, we began collecting data from the New Mexico Office of the State Engineer and the United States Geological Survey. So we're going into these sites looking for certain data. We are focusing on a depth to water so we can uh, build the map. So when we're going in here, we're um, logging in an Excel sheet. We're logging the depth of water, the easting and northing so we can get accurate points so we can create this map. So once we were able to get enough points from these websites, we were uh, we did some QA and QC and we uh, we refined this data uh, down to um, just like cleaned it up and got it real nice. And then we were able to create an XY scatter plot graph. So we were able to identify trends in a couple separate regions. And uh, this was all done in ArcGIS. So basically, when we had all the easting and northings and the depths of water, we were able to log them as X, Y points in ARC. And then we used a topography tool to map the locations of these points. So the topography is going to be like the background here you see. And then after we were able to get the topography, we were able to develop a contour from the depths to water. So that's what you're going to see here. Like we have these contour lines. But uh, this map, it's a, it's a map of the major cities, uh, the topography, the contours. We got uh, major rivers. I have a legend down here, as you can see. And um, yeah, that was what went into data collection and the process of building this map. Oh, I have one more slide. But yeah, so uh, the result of all of this uh, data collection that took weeks we're still collecting data but this took a long time but we were able to produce a map of the contours of all of these data points and um yeah so now we're going to have an accessible map for the public when it's done and it's published by the bureau they're going to be doing some ongoing research for this project but we were able to help uh contribute doing this but yeah, I have a map here of the uh, uh, trends in the northern region is what, what I was focusing on. But yeah, this is all along the middle Rio Grande Basin. Is, and if you're looking at it, you can kind of see everything is stable from the last 50 years. And I want to do my acknowledgments. For one, I would love to thank uh, Kelsey. She was a big help in every step of the way. Uh, all the Geo Launchpad, Haley was great, uh, my colleagues, uh, Natalie, Kai. Uh, the other interns really helped out. They're uh, an emotional support system for sure. And I did see that uh, my geography professor, professor was here. Shout out to Marissa Wald. She uh, really helped me and uh, pushed me to be here. Great, thank you, Charlie. That was awesome. Oh, and thank you to Anika as well. I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's fine. No. Um, okay, so if you have questions, you can put them in the chat. Also, you have the option of raising your hand and we can hear from you directly. So we have one question from Rory. Great talk. Do you know if anyone will continue to collect more data for this project after you're done? Yeah, this this is um this is good. It keeps on going. Like to this day, we uh we went in the office today and they're wanting to add a rock formation and, and so much other stuff. I mean, with the USGS, there's over 400,000 different types of well points here. Some are dormant, some aren't, some are being used, some are vacant, some are dry. It's, it's, uh, we we're scratching the surface here. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Krista, uh, Casey has a question. Yeah. So I was just curious, um, with how important that water source is, why was there no mapping or, yeah, it's like, what, what's up guys? <laughs> yeah, I uh, I wish I could answer that, but to my knowledge, uh, I'm not sure, you know, this is home for me. So it was cool to work on this firsthand and kind of help out. But as to why there was no uh, like hydrogeology atlas, I am, 
I'm not entirely sure, but I have a couple other colleagues who are going to be touching on this and hopefully they know, but I, I am not entirely sure. And Tyler would like to know what part of this project took the longest? Uh, the logging the data. So we were, we were individually going into the New Mexico office of the state engineer website and we were, we were reading through permits. Uh, some of them were just permits. Some of them were applications and some of them were logs to what actually had uh, depth to depth to water data. They have data on geology, just going through each of them individually and pulling out that data. And then even some of the points that we gathered were uh, inaccurate. Like we uh, put them into Google Earth and make sure that the coordinates are right. And uh, some of them weren't. So there was a lot of quality assessment and control. So. And one more question. Um, your work is a real public service. This is from Lon. Um, thanks. Are you more worried or less worried about future water supplies in New Mexico after doing this work? Um, I'm a little worried that there wasn't uh, too, too much information there, considering like this basin is as a life for a lot of people, you know, like we're using this to, to grow food, to water our food and it's uh it's pretty important and the bureau is doing a lot to get it done. That's great. Thank you, Charlie. Yeah, of course. Thank you guys for having me. This was great. Up next, we're gonna stay in the same world, same area. Kai, you're up next. Thank you, Anika. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, you sound great. Okay, cool. There's some fans, so it's pretty loud over here. Let me share my screen. <clears throat> okay. Addressing a New Mexico data drought, aquifer building, distributed temperature sensing, and water quality. So this um, this project, this aquifer mapping project uh, was definitely the focus of my uh, work at NMT this summer. Um, but because Layla is so gracious and so kind and really wanted to expose us to so many opportunities and uh, other facets of her of the hydrology department at NMT, um, she gave us a lot of opportunities to try different things. And I took everything that she offered. So um, we'll start off with my main project was the aquifer data mapping. So this project is helping um, with a mapping study that my mentor Layla Sturgis is working on with the hydrology department. Um, the information that that um, that is gathered um, is helping feed a couple of different initiatives uh, or the initiative of the map study, but it's also feeding these projects that are kind of going to feed into the study overall. So uh, one of the projects is the hydrology of New Mexico Atlas. Um, a lot of other states had an atlas similar and uh, New Mexico wants to have one showing its water sources. Um, also the New Mexico Water Data Act, which is the act that um, wants to make and, and aims to make water data accessible. So the problem with the situation was that there wasn't enough data. We, we, we didn't have enough water data available for the citizens of New Mexico. New Mexico. So as interns, we went ahead, used uh, the USGS website and uh, logs that they had online. And we sorted to through over 14,000 for some of us, 5,000 plus well logs. And we found depths to water, uh, elevation, a couple of other uh, pieces of information like dates and uh, location um, of the uh, of the permits and the well logs we were having. Um, and this gave us information that we were able to convert into spatial data. Uh, we did that uh, to make these contoured maps that I'm showing here. Um, and that was done by making a Tobuta roster in ArcGIS. Um, so the condensing and analyzing of this data was crucial to building up the data. We needed to pick information that was up to date, that was consistent, um, and that showed trends. And so once we were able to get that information, narrow down the information to single points, um, we were then able to um, 
uh, use the single points to plot the contours for our maps. Um, this is currently kind of an out of, uh, we're still building on this on this contour map, but this is uh, one that we had worked on and we're still kind of adjusting here um, as we find new information, because a lot of the information is doubled up, uh, it's not fully complete, and we have to sort through that to kind of make that decision and uh, QA the information. Um, and then on top of that, uh, we were able to find trends uh, by making charts out of the information that was uh, in Excel and determine, you know, what was uh, uh, usable for this project. Um, so this was the final result. We got these really cool maps. And then along with this, we were able to finally get out into some field work and get our hands dirty. We went camping for a week in the Valles Calderas with uh, Cherie uh, Kelly. Um, it was Sherry Kelly, and um, we got to use a te uh, distributed temperature sensing, which is a fiber optic cable that we use to measure temperature changes in the San Antonio Creek. Uh, the problem had been that there was elk that were perishing um, in this uh, wetland area, and they wanted to see where, where what was happening and where was it coming from. So in this volcanic field, we kind of started first by uh, going to a volcanic formation, seeing where we were getting fluctuations in the DTS uh, or distributed temperature sensing uh, information. And then we were able to determine where we needed to move. So we, we determined that it wasn't volcanic activity because the water was not consistently warm um, on DTS. It was actually only showing up warm during the day. So we moved closer to bedrock and that was uh, when we found more readings of this phenomenon of warm water coming in during the day, but staying cool at night coming in. And that was able to help us determine that there was three manifestations of a stream coming in from a, from groundwater um, in the bedrock. And that, that helped us find the pooling, which was the cause of the elk perishing. Um, so a really cool system. Fiber optics is just really sensitive and it uses pulsing a uh, laser to take readings of temperature changes. We did that over about a 12 hour day one day. Um, we also got, I also got to do uh, water quality uh, with Bonnie, uh, with Bonnie Frey. And uh, that was my first time in doing lab work uh, of any sort. So Bonnie taught me a lot. Uh, one of the things that we started off with was conductivity. We wanted to see how was electricity moving through our water samples. Uh, these water samples that I got to work with were from the Interstate Stream Commission and in compliance with the uh, Pecos, uh, Pecos River Compact, which promises water to Texas and delivers it. So we were testing those samples. We also got to test the alkalinity, uh, how acidic the uh, water was and uh, what kind of elements were in there. Uh, we found trace elements with the mass spectrometer and that again, helped us with the water quality. Um, something cool that I got to work on was a pipergraph. It was my first pipergraph I ever got to work on. And um, I compared some samples. So this is a really new pipergraph. I had uh, an extremely difficult time making pipergraphs because there was no data. A lot of the data had to be dug up. Uh, we would find pieces and bits and it's all coded. So you kind of have to put things into Excel, delete things, kind of QA. Uh, what is existing information and if it's usable. Um, and then with information we found from the Sacramento Mountain wells that feed into the Pecos River wells, uh, I was able to make this graph that shows that uh, even though the Pecos is just down way from the Sacramento Mountains, they had very similar chemistry and there was a um, calcium chloride water type that was consistent in the area. Um, and so these piper graphs would be used to uh, tell geological changes and fluctuations in the chemistry of the water. Um, here is also a map of the Rio Grande Basin, which is the area um, that we're working on. And you can see that the Sacramento Mountain is kind of right in the center of the Rio Grande and the Pecos River that meet down in Mexico. So that was pretty cool. Um, I got some pictures of me in the lab and those were really fun. Got to work with Tiamos, and I just wanted to make some acknowledgments and thank Earthscope, their amazing staff, for offering me this opportunity and letting me work with such amazing people. My mentor, uh, Layla Sturgis, for helping me build my skills and confidence 
uh, in problem solving, also for getting a system access. The, the Bureau of Geology, all the staff was amazing, made so much time for us to help where they could. Um, and my colleagues, Natalie and Charlie, for helping me dig up this data and keeping me lively in the office. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. That was great. Okay, we are over time. So in the interest of keeping things on schedule, you can put your chat, um, your questions in the Q&A section and Kai can answer them directly. Uh, can, can, you, can you repeat that one more time? Sorry. Um, I was saying that we're a little bit over time. So there's some questions in the Q&A section. You should be able to answer those directly. Yeah. Um, okay. How much did the mean like cut to see what you guys Okay. Some of the temperature changes. They were they were pretty drastic. You would only see spikes of hot water that they thought could have been volcanic water um, coming up during the day, and so that that actually made sense because the sun was out during the day and it would get cold at night, and uh, that would only that would happen in three different spaces. So we didn't see it coming only from a volcanic formation uh, space or the, the the where the stream the creek was closest to the volcanic formation. We saw it throughout the meandering stream. Cool. Thanks, Kai. We're going to turn it over to Caitlin now. Thank you. Hello. There's like a ringing in the background again. Okay. Is it there? Oh, OK, it stopped. OK, I don't know why I'm plugging it fixes it, but cool. Hi, my name is Caitlin. Um, this summer I did my project on the mineralogy and chemistry of the Lemitar carbonatites. Um, for some background, um, we did our research from existing mines in this area over here with the green pointer on the map. Um, the carbonatites are igneous rocks with more than 50% carbonate minerals and less than 20% SiO2. Um, they're the primary source of rare earth elements, and these are really important because they are crucial to many of our daily technologies. They have magnetic properties, phosphorescent properties, luminescent. There's a lot of special things that they have. Um, we were specifically looking at the Lemitar Mountains in Socorro, New Mexico, because they host over 150 dikes, veins, and stockworks of the carbonatites. Um, they are moderate in rare earth elements concentration and they have low tonnage. Um, currently they have low economic value, but drilling at further depths may determine otherwise. Um, we gathered data and we had a compilation of previously collected data, including mines and other prospects and previous chemical analyses. Um, we also gathered new data on the whole rock chemistry and mineralogy. Um, we did all of this. We looked at it through X-ray diffraction. Um, we looked at it on electron microprobe microscope, and we used IOGAS to make graphs of the data that we found. Um, I don't know if you can see my pointer, but on the left side of the left graph, um, we can see an enrichment of light rare earth elements, and on the right, it has it doesn't have it has low concentrations of heavy rare earth elements, and it is depleted in europium. And on the graph on the right, um, we have quartz, calcite, and flora apatite. Um, just to conclude, the Lemitar Mountains in New Mexico hold over 150 carbonatite dikes, veins, and stockworks of Cambrian Ordovician age. Um, they hold low economic value at present due to low concentrations of rare earths and have low tonnage, but further drilling may find something different. I would like to acknowledge the funding given by the Natural Science, National Science Foundation and the USGS, along with everyone at EarthScope who gave me the opportunity and everyone here at the New Mexico Bureau who was a great help. That was awesome. Thank you, Caitlin. Okay, if you have questions, you may put them in the Q&A section or you may raise your hand. 
So we have a question from Rory. Um, does the depletion of europium mean anything? Um, it, I th it means it was replaced by calcium. So it was a calcium rich environment in that area and it just naturally replace the europium because they can kind of cancel each other out. That might not be like the correct wording, but that's yeah. Um, the other question was from Caden. Um, hi, Caitlin. Very interesting work. I was wondering if you happen to know why there would be a U an EU dip in your samples. Um, it I think means that was replaced by calcium. calcium. <laughs> And then the final question so far is, how did you get the rare earth concentrations? What technique did you use? Um, we just collected the samples and we sent them off to the USGS for testing and they sent the data back to us. And then we run it through the IOGAS program and that's how we get to like visually see what's going on there. And they have a comment, the EU dip is also in mid-ocean ridge basalts from Melanie. Oh, that's pretty cool. Okay. Thank you, Caitlin, that was great. Thanks. Great answers to the questions. Okay, up next we have Nick. All right, sounds good. All right, hi, uh, my name is Nick Shepard. I'm a Geo Launchpad intern with Earthscope this summer, researching the effects of natural acid rock drainage on forest stands in Hancart Gulch, Colorado. So some uh, background information about Hancart Gulch is that it's located about an hour southwest of the Denver metro area at an elevation around 10,700 to 12,800 feet. Uh, it's an alpine watershed along the Continental Divide in the Colorado Rocky Mountain Front Range. It includes 13 monitoring wells, which absorb subsurface water, and we can use uh, the water from these wells to, uh, to research the water chemistry. Uh, so you're probably thinking, what is natural acid rock drainage? Uh, it's the geochemical reaction between oxygenated water and sulfide-containing minerals. And this results in the outflow of ex extremely acidic water. So in other terms, uh, natural acid rock drainage comes from atmospheric water that eventually rains onto the ground and it reacts with any mineral that has sulfide in it. So pyrite, for example. And this chemical reaction uh, results, uh, the result is acidic water. Uh, the South Platte River runs through Hancart Gulch and goes all the way through Denver into Nebraska. And this is a critical river as it supplies 50% of the drinking water. So it makes it a very important area of study. Some properties that may be affected by acid rock drainage include the soil composition, the tree health, and the water chemistry. So we will look at these three factors. Uh, to, to, see how, to see how it is affecting uh, the tree health. Some methods that we have conducted included uh, gathering the pH from the Hancart Gulch site, as well as gathering the pH from nine wells. And we compare the pH of the water quality and soil quality uh, to see what the effects are on the tree health. We also conducted river and soil measure measurements and to gauge a content of phosphate, total iron, and sulfate, as these minerals all have an effect on the acidity of the water. Uh, and geochemical measurements that we also conducted included pH, uh, which is the activity of the hydrogen ions in the river and the soil, the oxidation reduction potential. Uh, this is also how, how well water can clean itself. Um, and this is whether water is oxidizing, so uh, stripping electrons away or reducing or adding electrons. And we also looked at the electrical conductivity, and this is a proxy for the amount of dissolved ions or electrolytes in the water. And the middle picture is the, you can see that the South Platte River runs from the Northwest, that's where it starts, and goes Southeast 
uh, it's at a higher elevation in the northwest and a lower elevation in the southeast. And you can see that there are mines all around this area, and that can be a further method of research in the future as uh, mining activity might also have an impact on the chemistry of the water, the soil, and that can impact the tree health. So certain results that we gathered included uh, the Hankart Gulch site, and that resulted in a pH value of 3.07, which is very acidic, and the average pH value of the nine wells had a pH value of 4.72, which is also very acidic. So the lower elevation is where the Hankart Gulch site was, and that acidity was lower. There were also some satellite and satellite observations that we looked at. And on the left side, you have Hancart Creek. And on the right side, you have Hall Creek. They're adjacent creeks. And the Hancart Creek, uh, you can see in the picture, the light green is where there are no trees present. And the tan line right in the middle is the South Platte River. And you can see that the tree health is declining or not even present in that area. So that can be a result from the acidity of the water. And on the right side, you have Hall Creek, and you can see that there are many more trees that are present. So to conclude, uh, the Hancart Gulch site acidity, acidity was lower than the average of the nine wells all around the site, and that indicates a higher water toxicity within lower elevation of the South Platte, South Platte River. And the trees appeared to be impacted by the presence of acidic water, so high mortality and lower density observed uh, was obse observed where acidic water flooded from the stream. So future work is definitely necessary uh, to address the effects of acid rock drainage uh, and on the health of tree stands and how these tree species adapt to acidal, acidic and metal rich conditions. So we predict that soil iron loading and acidity will strongly affect the tree health and the species composition. And I'd like to thank Geo Launchpad and EarthScope for uh, allowing me to be an intern in this program. And I also thank Harry Brodsky and Tristan Carroll for being my great mentors. So thank you. Great job, Derek. Okay, same deal. If you have questions, put them in the chat or raise your hand. Um, there is a question. So Lon is asking, are there any old mines in the Hall Creek drainage? I'm guessing not. Did it serve as your control sample? Yeah, so uh, there are mines uh, all along uh, Hancar Gulch. Uh, we didn't look too far into this research as we were more focusing on natural acid rock drainage. So uh, the mining activity could be a future method of study, uh, but that would be a good control um, to see uh, how um, the acidity is, where it's coming from, if it's mainly coming from natural acid rock drainage or if it's mainly coming from mining activity, so. Um, Tyler asked, are there any potential mitigation strategies to help save the trees? Uh, uh, so always planting more trees is helpful. Uh, certain trees can adapt in more acidic conditions. Aspen trees can adapt at 5.5. Uh, pH, but this pH is lower. So usually uh, planting trees at a higher elevation would also help mitigate the effects uh, as the trees would soak up more of the uh, metals at, that they use to transfer and lessen the acidity. So um, that would be a method. So yeah. Um, with Steve asked, with such acidic water, is there any aquatic life? Uh, honestly, there is not, not that we saw, uh, there may be organisms that can adapt to acidic environments, but if the electrical conductivity is too high, or if the oxidation reduction potential is too high, then the organisms won't be able to thrive in those acidic environments. So. And finally, Melanie, did you need to process your electrical conductivity measurements, i.e. correct the data before using it? Uh, yes, we needed to make sure all of our equipment was calibrated appropriately because we didn't want any uh, measurements that weren't uh, correct. That would not be good at all. Um, so we had to make sure that the EC measurements were uh, uh, were conducted and taken um, appropriately. So, yeah. Okay. 
Casey, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, real quick. Um, so I know Boulder had a lot of weather. Did that did that affect your data collection? Uh, weather, uh, it didn't per se, just because it was such a short time. We believe that the natural acid rock drainage has been going on for uh, years. So um, just a, a incremental time um, may not have too much of an effect, but it does affect uh, the river uh, intensity. Uh, so, you know, the river would be at a higher uh, level than it usually is, but uh, it didn't really change any deposition or uh, any um, results that we would have taken. So, Great. Thank you, Nick. Thanks. Okay, we're going to turn it over to Sarah and Danielle. Okay. So my name is Sarah and I worked on contributions to the resilient St. Rain and how germophology and macro invertebrates um, change flood mitigation efforts in Northern Colorado. Um, so I am a geo launchpad intern and I spent the summer in Longmont, Colorado. And over the course of the summer, we focused on how macrovertebrates in the environment um, affect, you know, restoration of the St. Brain. Um, in 2013, there was a flood caused by the St. Brain Creek um, that damaged home trails and like streets. So in order to prevent, mediate, and predict future floods, Longmont started a multi-year flood restoration project of the St. of the St. Brain um, with aiding, aiding and providing for the ecosystem and the people surrounding it with the goal of repairing and revitalizing floodplains. So we spent that time at Dickens Farm Natural Area, which is located in Upper Longmont. And we used QGIS to like navigate and map um, vegetation in the area from 2005 to 2021. Um, and this is important because vegetation does have an effect on restoration and how water flow works in those areas. Um, for example, like um, invasive species such as like an olive Russian tree that can cause like blockage and buildup and kill the natural plants in those environments. Sometimes it affects the water quality and it's very important that water quality stays the same consistently throughout each year. And that's important to, to collect to see how during that time of engineering, how that water flow and frequency might be changing. And along with water quality, we worked on macroinvertebrate surveying, which um, is just examining different pockets of the river, taking bugs and bugs like midges or aquatic worms help determine the quality of that water and whether the sediment is depositing properly in those areas. Hi, I'm Danielle Matthews. Um, I also interned on the RSVP with Sarah. Um, unfortunately, due to the uh, wickedly unusual heavy rain, unlike Nick, we were affected. So we actually didn't get to start being in the river because the CFS, the water flow was so fast and so high, um, it would have been unsafe for us to do it. Um, so we really focused on the QGIS at the beginning of the project. Um, uh, the reason we do the affirmation surveys is to help give us an idea of the river quality and efforts of the restoration that has already been done. Um, the sediment surveys show us flow flows, uh, how the flows distribute sediments um, throughout the river, as well as the quality of the sediments. As you can see, um, this histogram, these histograms over here. Um, now we did um, the Wallman surveys um, for 11 of the restored areas in 11 places, um, but we were only able to do one of the restored um, and it may not look like a lot, but if you check over here, um, the percentage is actually quite substantially different. Um, and then 
for the uh, macroinvertebrate surveys or bug counts. Um, basically, you just disturb the rocks and you catch in um, mesh bags um, certain amounts, um, and then you try to identify the bugs and see where the water quality is from the types of bugs you catch. Um, so when we focused on the QGIS, we mapped the center line of the river um, throughout 2005 to 2021. Um, and doing that really gave us um, a way to graph the sinuosity, as you can see over here. Um, the incredible difference between 2009 and the 2013 flood year. Um, and then um, uh, we really would have liked to do much more. Um, like I said, we just didn't have the time and capability to do that due to the substantial rain. Um, if we did have more time, we would definitely collect more samples from the unrestored areas. Um, we wanted to do at least three, but we really only got one done. Um, and then we do a comparison between the unrestored and the restored area. But um, that would will just have to be for interns next year or throughout the rest of the season. Um, the project end date is estimated for 2025, but uh, we know how city projects go. So probably a little bit longer than that. Um, and we would like to acknowledge quite a few people. Um, this project, most projects take dozens and dozens of people, if not hundreds of people to cooperate and get things done. Um, but we would like to thank Anika and Kelsey, um, as well as our mentor, mentor Sharon Bywater Reyes. Um, Sarah also wanted to mention her uh, CNM mentor, Melanie, um, and amongst a dozen others um, for the positive support that we received during this. Um, and so much that we've learned. Um, it's been great and we enjoyed it. Great, thank you. Okay, we have time for questions. There is a question um, from Melanie. Great presentations. Was there anything in your research study that surprised you, i.e. something that was unexpected? Honestly, I think we interrupted a breeding ground, personally, for me. Like, we we had to have interrupted a breeding ground for dragonflies because I, I saw the most beautiful dragonflies I have ever seen. Um, and they were mating and doing things. And um, I'm sure we picked up some larvae that we probably just didn't recognize. But yeah, it, I, I was very surprised by the amount of dragonflies. Um, and I'm from Texas, so... Um, Kristen, you have a question? Or Casey, sorry. Yeah. Uh, what was one of the most difficult things that you guys had to do, either the travel out to the rivers or being in the river? You know, what was something that was difficult during your time? Or do you have an answer? Um, I'd say just the weather was difficult because, you know, it's an 11 week internship and we did it all mid July. Um, we did get it done. We did do our job as interns, but it's hard when you choose to do river science. So I say that was difficult. I don't think anything else. I think for me, probably getting in the river because um, as you know, I don't swim. So, <laughs> but overall it was a great experience. So I'm glad I had the opportunity to do it. I live in Colorado, but I live nowhere near Boulder or Longmont. So uh, so driving was definitely probably the worst part for me because I honestly love the water. Um, I feel like me and Sarah were a match made in heaven because um, we were very opposite um, on the spectrum, but we got along very well. Um, so so I think I think we definitely worked it out well together because um, I love the river and I was all about getting in there, so. Great, thank you. That was a beautiful presentation. Okay, closing out our Geo Launchpad presentations, we have Sebastian. 
All right. Good afternoon, everyone. I will um, get this queued up for you. That. Cool. Okay. So my name is uh, Sebastian Grego. I was with New Mexico Tech down in Socorro for the summer. And the project was, we're looking at acid mine potential or acid mine drainage potential in mine waste overall. And specifically this presentation is going to be about acid mine potential in the Blackhawk Mining District in Grant County. And um, just a little background to orient you guys where it is located. So it's going to be the bottom left corner of this map indicated by this blue icon. It's about 30 minutes away from Silver City going west. Uh, the Blackhawk mine is currently an inactive mine. So its main production or commodities that they uh, had pulled were going to be silver, copper, gold, and lead. And depending on the sources that I found online and some of the samples, uh, it also has been known to produce nickel, cobalt, and trace amounts of arsenic. And what accompanies a lot of metal deposits is going to be the iron sulfides, specifically pyrite. It's probably the most common one, mainly because it's a really good indicator of gold. And that's what miners used um, you know, before a lot of this technology to find gold deposits. So the problem with pyrite is it's a very reactive uh, mineral. And when it's exposed to oxygen, either through cracks or faults created by mining or from oxygen carried down by water, also via crack or uh, meteoric, it produces iron oxides and sulfuric acid. And sulfuric acid is sitting at about a 0.5 to 0.1 on a pH scale. So think uh, like a battery acid or a stomach acid. So it's extremely corrosive and it's extremely reactive, uh, especially with water. It's very, um, very volatile. So like I said, the uh, purpose was to measure the pH soil, pH levels of the soil, excuse me, to determine how much acid was present around the mine waste, as well as what is just at the surface. We also used uh, x-ray diffraction or XRD to see what minerals are present. And I'm gonna go back to that other slide, but to give you guys an idea of the map in the area, this is about 100 feet across, excuse me, 100 meters across and 20 meters um, in height. So we used a composite sampling method. Uh, we dug holes over that area about six to 12 inches in depth and about eight inches, give or take, maybe six to eight in uh, the radius. And all that means is we took a little bit of sample from one location, went to another one, collected some more, mixed it all up. And that just gives us a better idea and understanding of the overall area and a better representation when we do our qualitative and quantitative analyses. So for qualitative, we're just looking at composition and physically describing the grain size. And for quantitative, we're looking at our pace pH, XRD, and we're also doing bulk chemistry. And the bulk chemistry is mainly looking at carbon and sulfur levels. And that'll be done through ALS and the USGS. Um, but in-house testing was our XRD and PACE pH. And PACE pH is when you take a dry sample. We use about 25 grams to 25 milliliters of deionized water or pure water. And that sits in solution for about 10 to 15 minutes. After it settles, um, you kind of see down here, this is kind of the consistency you're looking at. Um, you want that to sit down in solution and settle, and you'll go ahead and take your probe, measure your pH, and that'll give you an idea of the acidity that is currently present. And that is the main test that paste pH does. It doesn't indicate what may be generated or what's potentially generated, but it's going to indicate what is happening, not necessarily in real time, but as close to as possible for the samples collected. And if you look here at the map from left to right, you can, um, you can look at the specific pH levels here, but I tried to color code them. So a general trend we're seeing is things are mostly basic, if not slightly basic and slightly acidic. So it kind of went both ways on the pH scale. And adding them all up and dividing them out, the average pH level was about a 6.88. So a little bit above a healthy lake or it is about as acidic as a glass of milk. So this could be due to a passive neutralization due to the host rock 
of the dolomite or carbonates. And it could also be from a lack of water precipitation being introduced to the system. And lastly, my acknowledgments. I want to thank uh, Geo Launchpad for you know giving me the opportunity to come out here to Socorro, be able to get my um, feet wet with some research. Dr. Wilcall, thank you so much for uh, recommending me to apply and do this. It was a pretty awesome experience. Um, Kelsey Russo Nixon, she was my Geo Launchpad mentor. She did a great job, very encouraging. The grad students that belong to uh, Ginger, they were great. Um, all around, it was a good experience. Oh, and also uh, Charlie and Natalie for helping me with the graphic in the first slide, and Tyler for sample prep, paste pH, and Eli for uh, some edits and helping out with some writing stuff. And that is it. We have a question. Oh, sorry. We have a question. Oh, questions. Um, yeah, so Melanie said, wonderful talk. What did you enjoy most, the field work or doing the lab XRD and pH experiments? Um, I, I think I'm a little biased. Like the lab work was, it was enjoyable. I mean, the drive out there, we're driving through like a washout riverbed and we're just, we're, we're looking at soil at the end of the day. But I mean, just like seeing the vegetation, the geology of it, it was just, it was really nice. And, you know, swinging a pickaxe has done that for a profession. And it's nice to just get out there and, collect rocks and soil. But uh, the lab work was definitely rewarding as well. Um, so I guess 50-50 is kind of a cop out of an answer. Um, the next question is from Rory. Why were there some basic samples in the area? Um, you know, it could be just the, the host rock itself is contained um, mostly dolomite. It contains, excuse me, mostly dolomite and the carbonates. It has a lot of calcium carbonate specifically. So it could be that we're not seeing any acid to lower that number, and we could just be getting the composition of the host rock. There you go. Um, Danielle said, what do you think will need to be done next, and will you keep track of the project? Uh, I think as far as from an exploratory and kind of economic geology standpoint, I think looking at the mine to potentially reopen it for future reclamation. I mean, you know, at the end of the day, it's, it's an open pit in the ground. So the mine waste right now may not pose an immediate uh, threat to the environment, but there's still a lot of pyrite as the uh, iron sulfides, right? But we also have found uh, galena and stalarite, which are lead sulfides. So those are equally, if not a little less of uh, acid potential. So maybe going back, figuring out, cleaning up the dump, either containing it or moving it completely away from potential water exposure, oxygen exposure would be a good step. Personally, I don't think I will follow it, but you know, I think it's worth Google every now and then to see what's going on with the deposits and how it's being handled. Any more? And questions? one more question from Casey. What was your favorite site to collect samples from? Um, it was pretty. It's pretty flat. I mean, I guess the. Oh, I don't have the map up anymore, but kind of where you pull in immediately off of the road. It was just a big, giant hill, so we were kind of scrambling on the side to throw dirt and stuff through our sieves, and that was that was fun. I mean, it wasn't like super exciting, but it was fun to almost like roll down the hill, you know. It was dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Sebastian. All right. Um, so, um, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Elashua Shepard. Uh, I want to thank you all for being here to ha let me have the opportunity to share my summer research with you all. This is my project entitled Mineralogical Differences as a Function of Color for the Turquoise Mineral. Uh, and I worked on this project with my two mentors, John Rockabon and Kelsey McNamara. They're both employees here at uh, New Mexico Tech and more specifically at the Bureau of Geology and Mineral Resources. Uh, so the main goal of our research was to um, really investigate the uh, mineralogy of turquoise and see if it has influence over the color using extra diffraction. And prior to conducting analysis, I tried to look for some studies that could help me uh, start, but a lot of them only looked at the provenance of turquoise uh, with the aim of mapping uh, pre-Columbian trade routes of the Americas. And there was almost no mention of color 
even though color is used in hand sample identification all the time, uh, we'll later prove that to be problematic. Uh, initially, we hypothesized that the color of turquoise would reflect the mineralogy and differences in the X-ray diffraction data would be subtle because all the turquoise group minerals are isomorphs. And that means that they have very similar structure. And to test our hypothesis, we compared the diffraction data to these uh, powder diffraction files. They're also known as cards from the International Center of Diffraction Data. And you can see those in the bottom right corner where all the turquoise group minerals are superimposed onto one another. And the little bars represent the known peak placement and the relative intensity of each phase. And in the top right corner, we can see two uh, samples from this study. And the image on the left was really the one that initiated our research, uh, depending on, despite the sample coming from the same uh, locality and the same mining district, uh, you can see the variation in color clearly. And uh, so, oh, what's going on? Sorry. So, So yeah, in our study, we conducted an X-ray diffraction analysis on 43 samples from eight mining districts. And depending on the quantity of turquoise available on the sample, uh, I either prepared a smear mount or a pack mount. Figures four and five on the top right corner, they show an example of a pack mount and a smear mount on a silicone background, sorry, a silicone zero background disc. And in sample preparation, I attempted to separate the matrix from the turquoise as much as possible to ensure the diffractometer was analyzing the turquoise not the uh, host rock. And all analyzed, all data was analyzed using the high score plus application, which is used in tandem with the uh, Bureau's Expert Pro X-ray diffractometer model. And it has a copper anode equipped with it. So all of our samples were subjected to five minute stationary scans of copper K alpha radiation. Uh, so uh, shown here are 43 samples that were scanned. Because it didn't seem practical to show all 43 samples, uh, I chose these best seven because I felt they best represented the color variation that we had in our sample suite. And you can see uh, these samples in the top right with the respective diffraction patterns. And if you notice, they all have a common dominant peak at 24 and a half degree two theta angle. Uh, slight variations in peak position suggest the possibility of solid solutions among our sample suite. But data quality and peak proximity prevented the quantification of this variation. And extra diffraction isn't capable of quantifying uh, the salt solution, uh, the salt solution composition. Um, I'm sorry, guys. And all the diffraction patterns were very similar, but the biggest outlier uh, was the sample that was labeled turquoise from the Oro Grande mining district. Uh, this sample was cataloged at the Turquoise Museum at New Mexico Tech, but the uh, analysis showed it to be a prosopite sample. And this actually uh, led to us scanning a calcosiderite sample that was also cataloged from the Cerrillos district. And this uh, later showed to be a planarite sample. And they actually were recataloged at the Mineral Museum because of my findings. Uh, so overall, we found that... Uh, Mineralogical differences uh, <clears throat> in turquoise. Uh, what is going on? I'm sorry, guys. I don't know what's going on with my computer. Uh, overall, our data the, suggests that color variation doesn't necessarily reflect the mineralogical differences in turquoise. But as I said before, slight variation in measured peak position suggests the possibility. Uh, that salt solutions of turquoise group minerals were present in our sample set. And further research should focus on the chemistry in these samples to investigate how chemistry should affect uh, color. And to close up this talk, I want to say thank you to my two mentors, John and Kelsey, who helped me out with this project. And I also want to mention Charlie and Natalie, who were very gracious enough to help me out with a figure on my poster. And lastly, I want to say thank you to the EarthScope Consortium for this amazing summer opportunity. I had a great time and I can't wait to share my research with you all. Thank you. Great, um, we've got a couple of questions. So Melanie said, very cool topic, excellent work. Did you need to use a standard and or low background sample holder for your XRD measurements of the turquoise samples? 
Uh, yeah, so I used the equipment that the, the Bureau had on hand, and they had these silicone zero background discs. I'm not too familiar with the equipment, but I just know that they're really good because uh, they don't really uh, diffract. So that's the whole point of it, to make sure that you're scanning your sample and your sample only. Um, great. Uh, Lon said, great job, Eli. What is the implication of your research and your advice? What is the implication of your research for and your advice to anthropologists who track pre-Columbian trade using turquoise provenance? Um, so really, our research kind of tells us that uh, if you're identifying turquoise based off color, it's not exactly uh, precise. And I, I say that for the people out there who are going to be uh, using uh, who are going to be uh, mapping turquoise, I suggest they use extra diffraction analysis because I feel like it'd be very good for identifying, a it's really overall good for identifying minerals based off their chemical structure. Um, sorry, off their mineralogical structure, yeah. Um, Rory said, love the talk. How did you categorize what was most green and most blue in your samples? Um, I didn't exactly have a method to doing it, but I did really, uh, I had my other two mentors kind of help me out where I was showing them like, does this sample look more green than this one? And that was the case with uh, the first two. Uh, if you see them in the slide right here, uh, the one from Hachita and the one from Enchantment, uh, I was it was a discussion I was having with my mentors where I was like, should I have this one on there or this one? And John suggested both. And I figured it was probably the best. Great. And Steve said, great work, Eli. Did you use a color scale like Munsell to characterize the colors of the different specimens? Um, no, I wish I had known about that, but no, I'm sorry, Steve. I didn't get to use that. Um. Okay, great job, Eli. Thank you. Up next, we have Hassan. So um, hello, good afternoon from beautiful Socorro, New, New Mexico to wherever everyone is at. Um, so my project is on the investigation of volcanic ash deposits from Ecuador and New Mexico. So to begin, what is tephra? It is any insoluble ma ma material erupted from a volcano, whether it be glass, minerals or lithics. Um, what is tephra chronology? It is a process of using tephra to correlate time across landscapes. You could either be working with proximal tephra, which contain all grain sizes, and they also present their mineral and lithic phases. And um, they are shown in the bottom right diagram in the gray region near the volcanic source. Uh, or you could be working with distal tephra, which are fine grain and only um, contain volcanic glass, and as shown in the diagram in the orange region, far from the source. So the first half of our project will be um, working on the Kilatoa volcano, which will shed light on the distribution of eruptive products and um, speak about potential hazards in the region. Um, and the second half of our project will be on sourcing um, the um, HEMIS samples, which will help to understand the landscape in the region. So some background on Kilatoa. It is located on the western volcanic sites of Ecuador and is one that has been through a series of powerful plinium plumes of moderate to large in size. Kilatoa has had eight major e eruptions with the youngest with the um, oldest of 200,000 years and the youngest of 800 years. Um, and we will be comparing five new tephra samples um, to the current stratigraphy of Kilatoa. Um, and moving on, the um, long history of the Hamas um, begins five, 15 million years ago. And, um, and the youngest is 800, is 60,000 years. And um, the long history of eruptions is due to the crustal weakness um, in the um, intersection of the Rio Grande Rift and the Hamas Lineament. And in the last 
two million years, there have been five explosive eruptions in the Hamas, and new research suggests that the youngest volcanic activity could be as young as 60,000 years old. So on the image in the left um, is an image of an electron microprobe that was used to characterize volcanic glass. The um, images in the middle are probe mounts with the top image being proximal coarse grain tephra from Kilatoa and the bottom of distal fine grain tephra from the Hamas. And the um, images on the far right display BSE, which is back scattered um, electron images, um, the top of inflated pumice from Kilatoa with uh, elongated vesicles, and the bottom of volcanic glass shards from the Hamas. Um, uh, moving on, the image on the left is a volcanic classification diagram confirming the fact that we were working with um, rhyolites. The TAS diagram, which it's called, compares the sodium plus potassium versus silica content. The blue group are samples from the Hamas with higher potassium and sodium values, and the red group are samples from Kilotoa with lower sodium plus potassium values. And the plot in the middle is a calcium versus iron plot, which shows the differences in glass compositions. The green region are the bandelier um, values with low calcium and high iron. The red is the La Cueva region in the Hamas with low calcium and low iron values. And the Lava Creek region in orange with high calcium and high iron values. And, and the, Despite sampling tephra from around the um, um, Hamas region, previous collected samples by my, by my mentors led us to realize that one of the samples were from the Lava Creek eruption of Yellowstone, and the vast area it covered is depicted on the bottom left image in the highlighted region. And the other two samples match the La Cueva tufts located in the Hamas as shown from the red line. Um, the image on the right is one of our tephra stratigraphy with a high correlation of our QS8 sample with the fifth eruption of Kilotoa, and also a high correlation of our QS12 sample with the eighth and oldest eruption of Kilotoa. So in conclusion, both volcanic sites are dormant volcanoes, meaning that they are not currently active. Um, volcanoes, but they're um, likely to erupt in the future. So understanding their um, eruptive um, history and distribution of tephra could bring a awareness to potential hazards and even provide evacuation zones for the region. Lastly, I would like to thank Dr. Nels Iverson that is here today and Dr. Nelia Dumbar, which is also which is also here today for their guidance, effort, and commitment um, with the project. I would also like to thank the New Mexico Bu Bureau for their genuine hospitality in providing me with the support needed. Um, last but not least, thank you to the RESIS and ERSCO program for providing me the opportunity to research these interesting and fabulous volcanoes. And lastly, thank you to Almica and all the um, interns for a great summer that um, I will always remember. All right, we've got a couple questions um, from Musa. Uh, what would you say was the your biggest obstacle while doing your research? Um, I would say it was working with the electron microprobe and specifically the samples in Kilatoa were um, elongated and inflated. So it was kind of hard to um, sample them. We were looking for glass, volcanic glass shards, and it was pretty uh, difficult to find them. So that's what I would say. Um, next question from Melanie, great talk. Regarding the microprobe experiments, can you comment on how long it took to learn this technique and perform the analysis? Um, so um, surprisingly, I arrived late to the internship due to my schooling. And I was basically just thrown on the 
um, micro probe and I just had to learn it on the spot. It took me like a week to understand some stuff, but over time I kind of got used to it and was able to kind of link things together to understand how it works and functions. Great. Um, Lon said, nice work, Hassan. Was the discovery of Yellowstone ash in the Jemez a surprise, or did you target that outcrop because you suspected it was anomalous compared to the abundant volcanic units in the Jemez? If you suspected the outcrop was unusual, what was different about it? Um, it was a possibility. Um, we weren't quite sure, but the dating of it, which, which is 630,000 years, um, matched um, one of the outcrops in the Hamas region. Um, but what was unusual about it is, um, if we look at the image here, um, on the bottom left, it kind of, it's a wide area of, um, ash deposit. And also it has a high iron and high calcium value, um, which was different than the, um, Hamas region. Um, Rory said, amazing work. Do you know what the size difference was between proximal and distal tephra samples? Um, distal tephra samples, if I'm not mistaken, are less than two millimeters. And um, proximal or coarse grain, anything greater than two millimeters, I believe. And last one, um, would you say, from Musa, would you say since you came late that you were behind? And if yes, was it hard to catch up? Um, like I said before, it was difficult, but I didn't expect anything to be easy. Um, my like, my faculty and, and all of them kind of told me that um, everything's going to be fast paced. So I like mentally had to pre prepare for it. And I just took it once step at a time. Great. Thank you, Son. Thank you all. Okay, up next, we have Kaden. Okay. So, uh, hello. My name is Kaden Burkhan, and my research over the summer was focused on the characterization of manta-derived kimberlitic zircon megacrysts. I did my research in Boulder, Colorado, uh, with the great CU Trail team. Um, so, uh, what are mantle-derived kimberlitic zircon megacrysts? Well, firstly, they come from the mantle. Um, the mantle makes up the majority of Earth's volume, yet studies of it have been extremely difficult. This is because the mantle is extremely deep, uh, generally tens to hundreds of kilometers beneath our feet, and there are very few places that mantle rock can make their way to the surface. Um, kimberlites are one such source. Kimberlites are volcanoes that can transport deep crustal and mantle rocks, such as those that carry mantle zircon to the surface. Zircon themselves are a mineral that is resistant to alteration. So we can use zircon as a physical marker for the age, composition, and makeup of its surroundings. Our study focused on determining if mantle zircon display properties of kimberlite magma or the mantle. To answer this, we acquired 21 zircon from eight kimberlites and obtained the uranium lead ages and trace element profiles. Uh, I will discuss two representative grains from kimberlites located in Brazil and South Africa. Our first sample here comes from the Wiener kimberlite in Brazil. Our trace element data is the left graph right here. Uh, by plotting normalized values of trace elements within our sample, we can create a trace element profile, which acts as a kind of like a rock fingerprint uh, when compared our when we compared our re, uh, sorry <laughs> when we compared our trace element data to a previous study in black we found that our data which is in orange here uh, trends similarly implying that our sample is indeed a mantle zircon after seeing this we would expect a mantle age of approximately a few billion years the way we acquire ages for zircon is through uranium lead dating. Um, this works because uranium decays to lead over time, which acts similarly to a geologic clock. Then we can measure the ratio of lead to uranium within the sample and plot them as shown as the graph on the right. Uh, what we found is that our Arena sample yields an age of approximately 92.6 million years. Uh, this state aligns with the previously reported Kimberlite eruption age uh, between 92 to 96 million years. So why would we see a Kimberlite age instead of a mantle age? 
Well, high heat can cause the release of lead from zircon, disrupting the lead uranium ratio and resetting the H to zero. zero. This kind of high heat can be found in two places, the mantle or during a kimberlite eruption. Either way, whichever caused this uh, loss of lead resulted in our zircon sample displaying a kimberlite eruption age. Now onto our second zircon. This one is from the Vorspid kimberlite in South Africa. We can see that similarly to Wiena, our trace element data in pink generally follows the previous study in black, implying a mantle zircon. Now, looking at the uranium lead data on the right, we can see that our zircon yields a crystallization age at around 3.29 billion years. Uh, the second age is displayed in the, as the lower intercept here. Uh, this implies that there was some sort of event at 2.51 billion years, which caused the zircon to experience lead loss. This, however, does not align with the previously determined kimberlite eruption age of 131.8 million years, meaning the kimberlite eruption did not significantly alter the zircon's lead to uranium ratio. So, in conclusion, both zircon displayed trace element profiles that are consistent with the previously determined kimberlitic mantle zircon. Uh, however, Wiena shows a uranium lead age similar to its kimberlite eruption, while Vorspid shows two uranium lead ages, one for its crystallization and one for its lead loss event. They are both mantle zircon that experienced kimberlite, a kimberlite eruption, so why don't they show the same age? Uh, who knows? <laughs> uh, more research could help determine why some zircon get their dates reset and some do not. This could have implications as well for the type of mantle material that kimberlites bring to the surface upon which we base our understanding of the mantle. Uh, now I'd like to thank the many people here that have helped with the project and would like to open the floor to any questions. All right, so we have three questions so far from Tyler. What instrumentation did you use for lead uranium dating? Did you enjoy using it? So um, we used the, uh, it's a microprobe. Um, they're not light microprobe. Uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, we used laser ablation, um, which is um, basically laser ablation, inductively mass coupled plasma spectrometer. I can't remember off the top of my head right now, but <laughs> it's LAICPMS. Um, basically just um, drill holes <laughs> into these zircon here and gets the um, data from that. Great. The next question is from Lon. Well done, Caden. Does the fact that the Brazilian zircon date was reset during kimberlite eruption, but the South African one wasn't, tell you something important about differences in mantle properties, such as temperature under these two cratons? Ooh. Um, let me read this just so I can get a clear head here. <laughs> um, it could mean that the zircon, um, the differences in mantle properties. Um, I'm not entirely sure, but I want to say it might have something to do with the temperature underneath the mantle or the composition itself of kind of what kind of minerals and material are underneath there. Um, yeah, <laughs> but it's kind of, yeah. Great. Um, so Melanie said, beautiful talk. Would you please comment on how you obtained the trace element data? Was that the ICPMS? Yes. Okay, um, so laser ablation. Mm -hmm. And then the next question was, what was the oldest sample you studied? The oldest sample, um, it's probably the Vorspid um, at the 3.2 billion years. Um, there was another one that was similar in age, uh, but yeah, that one's Vorspid one was the oldest. <laughs> Um, Rory said, that's my roommate. <laughs> what was your favorite part of the internship? Uh, my favorite part was probably when um, we were determining our samples 
figuring out which ones to use. And we got a, um, we were looking at the composition and we found out that actually one of them uh, was a diamond, not Zircon. Um, so that was a fun little find. <laughs> That's it so far. Oh, just kidding. Casey has a question. Hey, just real quick. You did great, Kaden. Um, <laughs> my question is, does you and your mentor have any like hypotheses as to why the ages are different or is it just like, eh, it is what it is? Um, well, I'm not going to speak for Spencer or Liam, <laughs> but uh, I think that um, it is probably something to do with either the way that these zircon were extracted, um, probably got altered in some form um, through the mining process because kimberlites themselves are hosts for diamonds, which is why we were able to find diamonds. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, like I think it's probably something along the lines of either the mining process or the high heat that's involved with a kimberlite eruption. And there's one final question um, from Spencer. How did you know that the sample that you found was a diamond was a diamond? <laughs> well, um, we used a machine that uh, told us of a very, so it, it, I don't know the name of the machine, but um, basically, um, we stuck it in a machine and it came out with a crap ton of um, carbon <laughs> um, enough where it confirmed basically that um, it's, it had like no trace elements or at, well, I mean, it had some, but like it was, it was mainly that it was the carbon and zero zircon. Thank you, Caden. Up next, we have Louisa. All right. Hello, everyone. Can you see my screen? Perfectly. OK, so my name is Louisa Gleason, and my project looked at phytoplankton productivity response to increased ultraviolet radiation in the community Earth system model. First of all, I wanted to highlight why phytoplankton are important. Um, they make up a majority of plants in the ocean and therefore comprise the base of the marine food web, which supports our global food supply. Additionally, their growth involves photosynthesis, which makes them part of the oceanic carbon cycle, and that contributes to carbon dioxide removal from both the ocean and the atmosphere. The climate model that we work with is version two of the community earth system model, it simulates interactions in low tropic levels of the marine food web and also achieves complex simulations of productivity when coupled to other models. One example is the marine biogeochemistry library known as MARBLE, which allows, a which allows unique parameters for phytoplankton functional types. And these parameters include nutrient uptakes and growth rates, growth rates which result in different biomass concentrations across vertical depths. So why are we concerned about UV radiation? As shown here on the first graph on the left, um, Earth's ozone layer naturally absorbs UVC, most of UVB, and some UVA radiation. However, natural and anthropogenic events such as asteroid impacts, uh, nuclear wars, and solar radiation management geoengineering projects can destroy this protective ozone layer. And then when enhanced UV, UV radiation reaches Earth's surface and penetrates the ocean layer, it can negatively impact phytoplankton photosynthesis. And the term we use to describe this damage, this damage is photoinhibition. To simulate the changes in phytoplankton productivity caused by high levels of UV radiation, we modified the climate model through the introduction of a UV inhibition term to phytoplankton growth rate and the addition of biolog biological rating functions for different uh, phytoplankton functional types. And these types include diatoms, coccolithophores, small phytoplankton, and diazotrophs. So a biological rating function quantifies the damage by UV to phytoplankton photosynthesis. And the three functions we've selected from literature are shown here in the second graph. Um, 
where the higher value, or like the higher the value on the y-axis, the higher the UV damage to photosynthesis of that particular phytoplankton type. And in general, we can see that UVB radiation leads to more photoinhibition than UVA because the natural occurrence of UVA radiation leads to organisms to adapt to it already. So after making these model modifications, we simulated two different scenarios. The first one um, included pre-industrial productivity, which is defined as the normal case. And the second one um, included an injection of 1,000 teragram of chlorine and promine into the stratosphere, defined here as the halogen case. Analyzing our results, we observed that the destruction of ozone led to an approximate 7.7% decline in primary productivity, which is measured in the amount of carbon fixed per unit time. This reduction lowered productivity from 55.79 petagram carbon per year to 51.48, uh, which you can also see in this graph here on the right. And if you look at this graph, you can also see the two seasonal cycles um, that represent the phytoplankton blooms in April and May in the Northern Hemisphere and in October and November in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, looking at other at, um, at the individual phytoplankton types, we found that the unshelled phytoplankton are more sensitive to UV radiation, which are these two small phytoplankton and diacetrophs, while um, diatoms and coccolithophores, the shelled types, almost lack the response. Other factors that might play a role in the response of phytoplankton productivity to UV radiation include vertical depth and spatial variations around the globe. Productivity below 50 meters was um, observed to benefit when phytoplankton decrease in the surface layers because the reduced shading uh, allows more light to reach deeper levels, which increases productivity. Lastly, um, we also observed that productivity declined mostly around the equator and along coastlines. And with that, I wanted to thank both my mentors, Dr. Nicole Lewandowski and Dr. Josh Koop for their guidance and support on this project. And also special thanks to my Earth Group advisors, the writing instructor, the graduate assistant, the entire Ocean Biogeochemistry Research Group, and my fellow summer research interns. Thank you, everyone, for listening. <laughs> OK, the floor is open for questions. You can raise your hand or you can put it in the chat. We have a question from Melanie. Um, very nice research talk. Prior to your summer research, did you have any experience in running simulation models? Were the models difficult to learn or understand? Um, when I transferred to University of California, Santa Barbara, one of my first classes was actually introduction to climate modeling. Um, so this is where I ran some yeah, some simple models in MATLAB. And here I used Python. So it was a different a different tool that I had to learn. But yeah, I was I was introduced to modeling uh, about a year ago. Great. And Lon said, really interesting work, Louisa. Nice job. What do you see as the next step to move this line of inquiry forward? Do you think the net effect on primary productivity was negative or positive, given that deeper productivity benefited? All right, I'm, I'm going to answer the first question. <laughs> um, I think the next step would be to um, look at photoprotective mechanism that some of the um, phytoplankton um, showed when I was reading research papers. There was a lot of talk about um, amino acids that might help in absorbing the UV radiation. Um, Haley, would you repeat the second question? I'm sorry. Yeah, of course. The next question was, do you think the net effect on primary productivity was negative or positive, given that deeper productivity benefited? I think the net effect was negative because a lot of phytoplankton in the surface layers were reduced. So. And a question from Casey, were there any concerning trends? Um, That's a good question. Um, I think concerning is that some phytoplankton react differently than others, which raises the question like what, what leads to that response and what can we learn from that? Great, thank you, Louisa, that was excellent. Up next, we have Natalie. Okay, so 
Hello, everyone. My name is Natalie, and I was one of three that was working on groundwater data along the Middle Rio Grande Basin. So to start, the main goal was to enhance the amount of data that we did have along the Middle Rio. So if you look at the map on the right, this was the section that we were working on. We started from about San Felipe all the way to Truth or Consequences. The reason for this is that there was really limited data in this specific region, and it was really important to really like enhance the amount of information since this water is used for irrigation, it's used for domestic use, um, household use, it's used for drinking water. So the fact that we didn't have as much data as we would like was a big problem. And overall, the goal would be to be able to get groundwater recharge and recovery methods out of this. I know that New Mexico is looking to adopt a method from California called the Soil Agricultural Groundwater Banking Index, which basically would get recharged from agricultural areas. But in order for this to happen, we would have to create water tables, and this would kind of set the foundation for that. So some of the methods that we did use were we collected data from the New Mexico Office State of Engineers website. We looked through permits and eventually well logs and basically looked for the depths to water on these as well as elevation or any dates such as that. USGS also did have a couple well logs, roughly 400,000 of them, either active or inactive. And all this information we piled together to create the map that you see on the right. Um, originally, we were only looking at three regions, Albuquerque, Belen, and San Felipe. But with the extra 400 logs from USGS, we were able to expand it down to truth or consequences. The contour map that you see on the right was made with ArcGIS Pro uploading XY data plots, and the contours are in feet when it goes down into the depths. And with the USGS well logs, we were able to make um, trends over time because they had about 100 wells that were retouched over the years from the early 1950s all the way to present time. And so we were able to see if there was any like consistency with the water, but mainly if it was just reliable, this like very old data. So in the end, the trends over time, one of the examples are the ones that you see at the bottom. This is in the Belen area, specifically on the map that you see on the right. And this was a log that was taken from that from the late 1950s all the way to the late 1990s. And you can see that it's fairly consistent, mainly because it is by the river. So the government's pretty good in um, keeping the water levels um, decently high and like available. But it's pretty important to um, figure out recharge solutions, especially here in New Mexico, since this is a pretty big uh, desert, really, and we want to have just like a savings for future drought purposes, as well as knowing having this information does create like a foundation to create a water table, which is essential for figuring out future drilling locations for either people who want to create like a household well or for farmers who want to create them for irrigation. Overall, all this information is really important just for awareness of the water availability in the state. And I do want to say thank you to Recess and Earthscope for giving me this opportunity to research this topic, as well as Anika for all her help, and my mentor Layla for her guidance on this project and her patience, to all the members of the Bureau, as well as my other colleagues, Charles and Kaisa, who did help in gathering the research to help build this map. Hey, we have a question from Lon. Nice job, Natalie. Establishing this baseline is so important. Same question for you as for Charles. Did the results of your study make you more or less concerned about groundwater availability in New Mexico than you were before? Um, I think I just didn't know a lot about the groundwater availability here in New Mexico. Um, coming here and seeing it, I do see like how much of a desert this place is. I wasn't aware of how many active and inactive wells there were, which I did learn after researching through USGS. I think I am a little bit worried just because a lot of these wells were, when they were retouched, they were pretty low, even like consistently throughout the years and like just doing research on droughts that might have happened or that might happen just makes, I kind of learned that the recharge is pretty important, like what we're doing.
Great. And from Rory, nice talk. What were some of the other trends that you saw across the data? So some of them we did see spikes, which did cause for some concern. Most of the most of the trends were consistent because we were mainly looking at around the river. So they're not really going to fluctuate. And our predictions were that most likely they were looked at at the same time of year within the year. So you're not really, if it's always after like the rainy season, like you're not really going to see any changes much. But when we did see like dramatic spikes was when we like researched into that well to see if maybe it was logged incorrectly because this is pretty old data and they did log it by hand, which was one of the main reasons to look for the reliability of it. Or there might've just been a problem with the well if it was like a perched aquifer instead of like actually all the way down to the bottom. These were like different things that we were kind of researching with the, when we were looking back and like making sure that the data was accurate. And from Melanie, very nice talk. Any comments on creating new recharge solutions for the area? Um, I don't know. I really like um, California's method of just kind of using the agricultural lands to sink it in. I know that it is important to find which one's the most ideal spot to do recharge because uh, my mentor was telling me that mounding could occur, which is when the water doesn't really soak into the aquifer all the way to the bottom if they hit the water table incorrectly. So maybe looking into some of those things, but besides that, I am unsure. That's great, thank you, Natalie. Up next, we have Tyler. So hello, everyone. Um, I'm a recess intern here at EarthScope, and my summer research was earthquake relocation in southeastern New Mexico to better understand induced seismicity. And my mentors were Mary Litherland and Amy Record. So over a span of three days in June of 2020, a swarm of 603 earthquakes occurred in southeastern New Mexico specifically in the Permian Basin, which is also called the Delaware Basin. And the uh, red circle uh, on the left side of your screen shows that uh, geographic region of our study. Over 97% of oil production in New Mexico occurs here, and drilling has been on a steady rise ever since they discovered that there were oil deposits here. Um, and this is a very popular site for oil drilling because the layers of carbonate rock hold large reservoirs of oil and one well can hit multiple reserves. And it is not the drilling itself that causes earthquakes, um, rather it is the wastewater injection uh, that happens after the oil is pumped up and uh, the wastewater is pumped back into the earth, which I have a cross section of. Um, showing that on the right side of the screen, uh, that is the specific oil drilling practices of this area that we studied. And seismometers in this area were able to pick up basic location information, but the locations needed to be clearer in order to understand what subsurface structures could be happening here. So we used relative relocation to more precisely determine these earthquake hypocenters. And the theoretical basis of relocation states that if the distance between two earthquakes is considerably smaller than the distance to the station where both events were recorded, then the earthquakes likely took a similar path to that station. And programs have been created based on this, such as the one we used, Grow Plus, and they've been created to quickly and accurately relocate earthquakes. So Grow Plus, the program that we uh, specifically use, is an algorithm that performs relative relocation using the double difference method and also waveform cross correlation. So the double difference method is outlined in red and it determines the quality of a relocation by comparing the observed arrival time to the calculated arrival time. So into the program grow Quest, we input our cross correlation data, station and event lists of the earthquakes, and a velocity model. So the algorithm would know how fast the waveforms travel through the Permian Basin. Um, and then each event is giving a starting cluster number and compared to each other, which creates pairs of earthquakes. And then each pair is ranked by a coefficient and the first ranked pair is the most similar pair. 
And then it uses the double difference method for a grid search to decide whether or not to merge event pairs and where these events should be relocated. And then it output a relocation catalog. And we use this relocation catalog to translate into maps to see the progression of the swarm in time and space, and to also look for possible subsurface structures or paths of fluid injection. So 380 out of 603 events ended up being successfully relocated by this program. And in the upper map, uh, you will see the original location map labeled A and the relocation map labeled B. And we do see improved clustering here. Um, linear structures become clearer towards the top of the map, especially um, along the highway. And we also see here through the color bar that the earlier earthquakes tend to start close together and the later earthquakes are more spread out. And this shows us that the initial earthquakes uh, probably propagated close together and interacted a lot with one another. And then later, aftershocks occurred farther down these faults. And then on the 3D map that you see in the lower corner of your screen, I have the original locations in the bluish purple and the relocations in the red. And from this uh, 3D map, we can kind of see that there were two main depths that this activity was occurring at, about two kilometers and seven kilometers. Um, and this is indicative of that there are two main faults, um, and those are the depths at which they are. Um, overall, more accurate swarm locations lead to a better understanding of faults and fluid injection paths in certain areas. And I would also like to point out that this is a pilot project and we are planning on working on relocation, more relocations uh, throughout the Permian Basin. And I just wanna say thank you so much to the uh, New Mexico Bureau of Geology for hosting the internship. Um, thank you to my mentors for mentoring me. Uh, thank you to EarthScope for hiring me and providing guidance uh, throughout this whole project. Um, and also thank you to my college, Augustana, uh, specifically Susan Wolf, um, for letting me know about this internship and helping me with all the work that it took to get in. All right, we've got some questions. So from Melanie, really nice talk. Before doing this research, did you have any experience in seismology? What do you see as the next steps for this research? Um, so I had very little experience in seismology. I had before this, I had never um, taken a physics class or any sort of uh, seismology class. Um, so it was definitely a learning curve, but I really enjoyed uh, learning more about it. Um, and next steps I would say would be to continue to do relocation uh, throughout New Mexico um, and also just throughout like oil fields in general um, to hopefully get some uh, mitigation strategies uh, going based on what we see in the subsurface. Um, great, from Lon, well done, Tyler. Based on your results, do you have any specific recommendations for regulators about where they should avoid issuing injection well permits to reduce the likelihood of triggering induced earthquakes? Um, I don't know too much about that, but I would say definitely avoid having so many close together um because that is going to cause um not only not only trigger earthquakes but also like more earthquake earthquake interactions uh which just leads to more induced seismicity overall so definitely um limiting how close you have them together i think would be helpful um so nick said do you think you'll be able to relocate the rest of the 223 events from the 603 total that's a good question. Um, it's definitely tough. Uh, it's what the it's the specific velocity model we used is what um, allowed for that number of re, uh, relocations. We used we tried several different uh, velocity models, including like the IASB, like general earth model, um, and they all relocated a different number of earthquakes. So Definitely trying out different velocity models was helpful, but we got the best results from the one that we ended up using. And K Casey said, is this a project you will want to continue to be involved in? 
Um, I definitely would be uh, down to keep working on it. Um, it's just a lot of it's a lot of just like computer work and uh, inputting the data into the computer program. Um, so it's able to be done remotely. Um, and yeah, I love making the maps and stuff. So definitely. And from Susan. Awesome. Tyler, what was the range of magnitudes of the earthquakes? So we used a range of, I believe that they were all in the one to three uh, magnitude range. So uh, nothing huge, not felt by a lot of people, but uh, definitely significant when you have that many going on within like a short three day period. Great. Thank you for sharing. Up next, we have Rory. Hi, everyone. Um, so my name is Rory Sankwadi, and my project was focused on quantifying spatial and temporal drivers of geochemistry along a metal impacted reach of an alpine stream. So where exactly are we located? So we're looking at the Cold Creek watershed, which is in Gunnison County of Colorado. That's about 200 miles or so southwest of Denver. So we had five main sites, uh, as you can see from this figure, located across the entire watershed, but we were focused on looking between two at CC6 and CC8. And this is due to the interesting geology of the area. This is located on fractured granodiorite, which can introduce many, introduce many metals, along with uh, the mines that are present in the area that can also do the same thing. So in examining these types of streams, they can give us insights into the types of workings of the hyporaic zone, which is basically think of it as like the transitional zone from a the stream water to the actual ground surrounding it. Um, and also give us an idea of general types of flow paths that might exist. So with my study, we used synoptic sampling, which is basically you take periodic measurements walking down the stream, particularly from this CC6 to CC8 with pH, temperature and specific conductance, which is basically a proxy for the total amount of solutes dissolved in the stream to be able to gain an understanding of groundwater surface water interactions. And the main two questions that we wanted to answer were, what are the sources of geochemical changes between CC6 and CC8? And then what other types of changes might be recorded within the pH, SC and temperature data? So we collected all of our lovely data and we decided to look across spatial differences and temporal differences. So changes in space and changes in time. Um, so the 2023 data listed in red shows about the um, spatial differences between the sites. Uh, as you can see, the pH stayed between a relative neutral value of 7.3 to 7.8, which is generally what this stream, what we saw in the stream. Um, and SC specific conductance varied by a range of about 15 micro siemens per centimeter. So even though these changes were pretty small, even anything that we might see in the trends on the data would be very significant. And as you can see, there were many spikes that line up, which uh, hints towards the types of changes that, um, or the types of sources that might be inputting things into the stream to make these changes. Um, but as you can see on the right here, this is the 2022 data which records the changes in time. And we compare that against the year, this year's data. We took the average as listed in this red X here, and we saw wanted to see how it compared to see what type of trends it might be following. Um, so, well, all of these changes were mostly due to snow melts. This is characteristic of many Alpine streams. We see that they go through a change from a snowmelt dominated to a groundwater dominated stream as you have a large snowpack usually during the colder months. And then whenever it starts to get warmer, the water will melt and that will introduce the many changes as you can see from this little first number here on this figure. Um, but we were also wondering what might be the cause of the spatial changes that we saw. And that's due to two possible sources. We have acid mine drainage due to sulfide mineralization from like the mines in the area, um, which can introduce these types of changes here. And then uh, water rock interactions with calcium carbonate mineral rocks to introduce these types of changes that we see here. So um, through analyzing the data and looking at how the peaks go up and down, we came up with the possibility that it is probably due to snow melt and acid mine drainage as to why we see the changes in the dips and heights of the data. So 
This means that there are possible groundwater surface water interactions along many parts of the stream, um, but there are very many limitations to this, like there were not all of the reactions could have been recorded that would have uh, pinpointed the exact location of these sources. And then also calibration of instruments can lead to differences in the measurements, particularly because we had to use a probe. And then there was also continuous measurements from a different type of probe. So that can just introduce a lot of different errors. But overall with this, we wanted to establish where groundwater, when and where groundwater surface water interactions are happening so that we can create better remediation strategies and see how water quality varies across the stream. So I would like to thank a lot of people. I'd love to thank my mentors, Kamini Singa, Dr. Kamini Singa and Kenny Swiftbird for their help on this project. I'd love to thank, oh, a quick shout out to Jose Montoya for helping me with a lot of this work on this project. And also thank you to Dr. Karen Luttrell from Louisiana State University for introducing me to this project. I would have never known about it. And I am so grateful that I got in to work with a lot of amazing people this summer. Also, thank you to Sylvie Darcy because I would not have been able to make the School of Minds without her. So thank you so much for that. And also just thank you to all of the recess interns in general. Okay, we have a question from Lon. Nice work, Rory. The town of Crested Butte gets its drinking water from Coal Creek. Based on your results, do you have any recommendations to the Crested Butte water managers for ways to ensure that their water is clean, such as seasons where water quality is at risk? I will have to say that, um, let me see the question just to make sure. I think that they should definitely try to warn people against drinking against most of the water just to see because there's many different fluctuations that might arise due to like how I was talking about it's a snow melt dominated stream to a groundwater dominated stream. Whenever it starts to become more groundwater dominated, that can introduce many changes of it'll usually incre increase the um, P or decrease the pH of the water and increase the SE, and that increases a lot of minerals that you might not want to be introduced uh, drinking. So I would just say, like, kind of warn against really just drinking the water from this stream. Um, great. And Spencer said, "Did you learn any fun lessons while you were out in the field? Any mishaps?" Um, <laughs> I will say that you gotta have patience with a lot of these things because like the pre we had gone out on another field work trip the week before and that was honestly like a little bit of a disaster so <laughs> coming to here we just had to like have patience and maybe work make sure we can work through it together and just like try our hardest to make sure that like the work would go well so yeah great and Nicole said, great job, Rory. Was there any data that was surprising or unexpected? Um, I mean, most of the data that we saw was pretty interesting because much of the area is located on clay. So the clay does not help with like groundwater surface water interactions. So whenever you see any type of fluctuations, that's like pretty interesting. And that's like pointing towards the things that might be happening in the subsurface. So just like generally, just all of the data that we collected, I will say, honestly. And a question from Melanie, excellent work. Can you please comment on the nature of your most exciting discoveries or findings you identified in your experiments? Um, I will say probably due to well, there was a very interesting spike in the data that we saw that was like a drop along many of the reaches. So that was characteristic of a pretty strong groundwater or surface water uh, interaction zone. Like I think it was located along like 270 meters or something across the reach. So, I mean, I would say that was probably the most exciting or interesting thing that I could point out in my data. Great. Um, Kamini Singha said, nice work, Rory. And then we have a question from Casey in the audience. Hey, <laughs> um, just quickly, I wanted to ask, I know that the weather, I don't know if the weather played a part in like traveling to and from your site. Um, cause I know we got a lot of weather down here. So like, how did it affect, um, travel? Yeah. Thank you for asking that. I actually did not get like most of my data until like two weeks ago. So like, 
<laughs> yeah, that was due to much of the, this was like the biggest snow melt year in like the past 40 years or so. So like there was, the stream was running really high the very first time that we went out into the field. So we were unable to really do any of the measurements that we wanted to collect. So it was disheartening for that, but I mean, at least I got the data now. So I got this cool research to present. <laughs> Thank you, Rory. Okay, up next, last but certainly not least, we have a returning recess intern, Sharada. So while the other first year interns opted to, not opted, they worked in Colorado or New Mexico, Sharada was able to choose her mentor and choose her research location. So she was at Georgia Tech this summer. With that, I will turn it over to you, Sharada. Uh, one sec. All right, cool. Uh, all right, hi everybody. My name is Sharada and I'm gonna be presenting all about the work that I did this summer on mid-ocean ridges on the early earth. So first of all, what is a mid-ocean ridge and why do we care so much about it? Well, at mid-ocean ridges, tectonic plates are spreading apart to allow for the creation of a new oceanic crust. But these are also the sites where these plumes called hydrothermal vents originate. So as seawater infiltrates into the crust and interacts with really heated rock, uh, you get these chemical reactions that produce minerals that actually serve as energy sources for all sorts of specialized organisms on the seafloor, just like the ones that you can see in this picture. And so this source of geothermal energy to catalyze reactions has led many to believe or hypothesize that if hydrothermal vents like these existed on the ancient earth, they potentially could have been the sites for the origin of life. And so our modeling here aims to figure out what if that could have potentially been the case. Right, so you might've figured out from the title of this talk that we're mostly looking at mid-ocean ridge depth. And by that, I mean the depth of the mid-ocean ridge crust below sea level. And so why specifically look at that parameter? Well, a previous research shows that the depth below sea level is a major factor in actually controlling the amount of hydrothermal alteration that occurs in mid-ocean ridges or those chemical reactions. And so with that in mind, we can come up with a few motivating questions for our work. So first of all, how do different modeling parameters affect our estimations of mid-ocean ridge depth? And also, was ridge depth on the early Earth actually sufficient enough for significant water rock interactions to occur that allows for uh, had those uh, chemical reactions to happen, which may have set the stage for the origin of life? So how do we use computer models to figure out mid-ocean ridge depth? Well, the process is kind of like using code to simulate building a big bathtub and then dumping a bunch of water in it. Uh, so we first start out by modeling our ocean basin, and we can change the shape of our uh, mid-ocean ridge within that basin a few different ways. And so one important way that we can do that is by changing the equation that we use to model this curve uh, of the seafloor near the mid-ocean ridge. And here we use five different equations to do that from the literature. And so what we can also change is how rigorous the mantle underneath the crust is uh, convecting. Um, so this changes the age distribution of the seafloor, which then changes uh, its shape. And so now that we have our modeled ocean basin, we can dump a bunch of water in it. And so when we're modeling uh, current day, it's fine to just put in the amount of water that is in our oceans right now. But billions of years ago, the amount of surface water may not match up to the amount of surface water today. So we choose ranges for the amount of seawater in the Hidean and Archean eons uh, to account for any of those potential variations. And then finally, our code allows us to estimate the average distance between mid-ocean ridge crest and sea level. Uh, and so the reason that we're changing all these modeling parameters uh, in our work is to figure out how ridge depth changes with different conditions, because we don't have time machines and we can't know exactly what conditions were like on the early Earth billions of years ago. So to look over the results of our modeling, uh, let's consider two different scenarios that have to do with the convection of magma in the Earth's mantle. So some researchers believe that convection has stayed at a constant rate uh, over Earth's history, while others believe that convection started out really rigorous when the Earth was a magma ocean and then slowed down over time as the Earth cooled. And so what do each of these scenarios mean for mid-ocean ridge depth? Well, here are two graphs of mid-ocean ridge depth versus time. And each of these data points is an estimated ridge depth. 
with the shape representing the amount of convection and the color representing the equation that we're using to model the shape of the seafloor around the mid-ocean ridge. And so we get these vertical air bars for the Hidean and Archean, by the way, because again, we're varying the amount of seawater available in those past eons. So in this constant convection scenario, we see that for all the models that we tested, um, mid-ocean ridges just get deeper over time going towards modern day. But in the slowing convection scenario, things are a little bit different. Mid-ocean ridges start out almost as deep as present day, uh, which is marked by uh, this black star, but they actually get shallower going in the towards the Archean and then get deeper again going towards modern day. So we can see that uh, the convective regime of the Earth has a significant impact on the evolution of mid-ocean ridge depth over time. But what does this all mean from an astrobiology point of view? Well, previous work has shown that a mid-ocean ridge depth between 2,400 meters and 2,900 meters below sea level is ideal for maximum amounts of hydrothermal alteration to occur. And while mid-ocean ridges don't reach that ideal depth, with that constant convection scenario. In the slowing convection scenario, multiple models show that in the Hadean and Archean eons, mid-ocean ridges may have been deep enough to, for those complex chemical reactions to occur. And so ultimately, this is really positive in terms of looking more closely at a hydrothermal origin for life on Earth, although there's a lot more research to be done uh, to put all those puzzle pieces together and really substantiate that hypothesis. Uh, so to end off here, I'm going to uh, give a big shout out to my mentor, Dr. Shidoi Sim, for being so amazing this entire summer. Um, and also big thanks to everyone on the recess team, specifically Anika Knight and Kelsey Rusa Nixon, as well as the other recess interns, uh, specifically former intern Kennedy Godana, who did a ton of work on this project um, uh, that I was able to build off of. So thank you so much. Okay, we have some comments. We have a comment from Kamini Singha. Shraddha, great to see you again. Very cool to see what you worked on this summer. And then we have a question from Lon. Fascinating research, Shraddha. Knowing what you've learned for this project, do you favor mid-ocean ridges as the cradle of life on Earth? Or are you more skeptical? Or is your research inconclusive? The Rayleigh number is a really important parameter for your work. Do you have suggestions for ways to better constrain the Hadean Rayleigh number? You can start with the first one and then I can redo the second one. <laughs> Okay, cool. Yeah. In terms of actually favoring a hydrothermal origin for life, I've always thought of it as a really appealing idea, just because it's just, you know, you've got everything you need for life. You've got um, the minerals as your energy source and also a ton of heat and a ton of water. So it's always been a super interesting kind of uh, hypothesis to look at for, as someone who studied astrobiology. Um, but in terms of like actually like this, like convincing me or not, I think it maybe yes a little bit in terms of like the slowing convection scenario, but again, in that constant convection scenario, which could have also been true, um, you know, it doesn't like we don't really get maximum hydrothermal alteration. So it's honestly really inconclusive to me. I would like to believe it more, but you know, again, this is just also one piece of like a really complicated puzzle. Mid-ocean ridge systems and uh, hydrothermal vent systems are super complicated. So I feel like I'm just looking at one angle of something something that's honestly much bigger. Um, but yeah, and so the second question was about constraining the Hadean Rayleigh number, right? Um, yeah, that's also really difficult, again, because, you know, the girls are fighting in geophysics. There's no real consensus on, um, like, what the convection was like uh, back then. And again, like, the evolution of convection has been such a topic of debate that, honestly, like, I would need to look more into the literature and, um, like, really look into all the factors that play into estimating the Rayleigh number to like figure that out. And that that could be a potential direction for future work. Um, we have a question from, I'm sorry, could you say the name Kineni? Kineni? Kineni, yeah. Kineni. Okay, we have a question from Kineni in the audience. Hi, can, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes, I'm, I'm driving right now. But yeah, wonderful, wonderful talk. Um, yeah, plus what you were saying about the convection speed as opposed to like, I, I remember when I was doing this project, I was referring to like spreading rate as opposed to convection, but that's such a better way to like impose things. Um, but like uh, for kind of like the whole project, was there anything that you were doing in the modeling that kind of surprised you in terms of like parameters and stuff? Like I remember when adding like radiogenic heating and stuff, I did, like you look at heat budget all the time and you're like, wow, this has a really 
big part to play but then when you see it in action it's really interesting is there any parameter that like you looked at when you were modeling that like really surprised you that what like was affecting things so much yeah um honestly like it's kind of like the opposite there was like I mean, I used a bunch of different models and a bunch of different equations to come up with these graphs. And honestly, what surprised me was that a, that a bunch of different graphs or like equations were giving me kind of the same trends. So some of these uh, equations were observation-based. So like looking at the seafloor shape and kind of fitting an equation based on that. And that's how you get like that equation that describes seafloor shape. But some of them are purely based off physics, like just pure theory yeah. to come up with these equations. But then even with testing both like plotting the bridge depths um that you get with both of those like kinds of models you're still getting the same trend so that was honestly what surprised me gotcha yeah super super interesting yeah wonderful talk we can talk later and stuff too yeah wonderful so um we have two more questions so far um from melanie excellent presentation hydrothermal vents are now being looked at for deep sea mining of rare earth elements etc do you see your modeling efforts or parts of your efforts impacting this economic interest yeah, I don't know. Um, yeah, this is kind of like, I guess, like in terms of like economic interest, we'd more be paying attention to like present rates of like hydrothermal like alteration, and like seeing you know how, um, like how what we can get out of current day. Like, I don't know how much knowing about like hydrothermal alteration like billions of years ago would help like to figure out like tar to target like certain areas in present day. But I think that the like, you know, aspect of the research that has to do with, you know, this ideal zone of um, mid-ocean ridge depth could potentially help in terms of like finding which areas of a mid-ocean ridge you would want to look at for uh, resource extra extraction, so. Great, and then from Nina, amazing presentation, Trada. In your opinion, are there any particular areas we might want to focus our attention on in terms of finding any mid-ocean ridge or hydrothermal vent activity? Are there any moons or planets that stand out? That's so cool. That's such a good question. Um, yeah, the whole question of plate tectonics on other planets is like a big thing in geophysics and planetary science right now. Um, I think like this is a really unexpected one, but honestly, I've always been like, of like a fantasizer about uh, uh, plate tectonics on Venus. Um, obviously they've probably ceased now, but people think that maybe like Tesserae, which are these big trains on Venus could have potentially been uh, continents uh, many, many years ago, uh, billions of years ago in the past. Um, so it'd, it'd be really cool if we figured out like, oh, like hints of a mid ocean ridge system on Venus, which is like a hell world in modern day, but may not have been, uh, you know, in the past, so. Great. Great responses. Okay, that is the end of our program for today. I want to thank everyone for attending. I want to thank all of our interns for giving amazing speeches, amazing presentations. You also clearly explained what you worked on this summer. I hope you're all very proud of what you accomplished because we're proud of you. Um, and then again, as we've said many times in all of our presentations, thank you to the National Science Foundation. Um, without you all, our projects would have not been able to be accomplished. We've been able to serve so many amazing students and they wouldn't be able to complete such amazing work. Um, thank you to all the institutions that have hosted our interns, those that have worked with us on funding sources, those that are just being mentors to all of our students. We really appreciate all of you for your continued efforts in working with us. Um, again, as I said earlier, see our interns this fall at a conference. They're all gonna, a lot of them will be at GSA or they'll be at AGU or they'll be at both. And we will send out a list of where the posters are, where their presentations are, so you can come visit them. Um, and yeah, thank you all for joining us today.